order leader. Mr. Speaker, may I seek your consent and the general assent of members present to move that the proceedings on the item under discussion be exempted from the provisions of Standing Order No. 48-8 to remove the time limit in respect of the Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong's speech. I give my consent. Does the Leader of the House have the general assent of honourable members present to so move? Aye. Leader, please proceed. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the proceedings on the item under discussion be exempted from the provisions of Standing Order No. 48-8 in respect of Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong's speech. The question is, as moved by the Leader of the House, as many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Do the contrary say no? I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A motion standing in the name of Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance on Singapore's COVID-19 response. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this House expresses gratitude to all in Singapore who contributed to the nation's fight against COVID-19 affirms the government's effort to learn from the experiences of the last three years, and to that end, endorses Paper Command 22 of 2023 on Singapore's response to COVID-19 lessons for the next pandemic. Sir, this white paper is a culmination of several months of review of our responses over the last three years of the pandemic. This has been the crisis of a generation, a battle against one of the most disruptive viruses the world has encountered in recent history. The crisis upended our lives in ways we never could have imagined. In the most acute phase of the pandemic, our economy ground to a halt and workers lost their jobs. Many key life events were put on hold. Some of us suffered the pain of losing loved ones during this difficult time. Others were separated from family members who were based overseas. The whole experience has fundamentally challenged and shaped who we are as a people and as a nation. Today, we have fully transitioned to living with COVID-19 as an endemic disease. The virus is still amongst us and no one can tell how it will continue to evolve. But for now, the evolution seems to be plodding, with minor tweaks to its genetic code rather than major changes that require another Greek letter name. So it is timely to take stock of our response so that we can start preparing for the next battle whenever it comes. On the whole, compared to other countries, we have done well in protecting both lives and livelihoods throughout this pandemic. Our healthcare system, though strained, was never overwhelmed. Our case fatality rate is one of the lowest globally. Our vaccination rate is amongst the highest in the world. We budgeted around $100 billion to respond to this crisis. We eventually spent $72.3 billion, rolled out over eight budgets in financial years 2020 and 2021, partly because we had been prudent in our spending. The actual amount was less than budgeted, partly because we had been prudent in our spending, and also because we avoided some of the worst case outcomes we had prepared for. Our financial resources enabled us to mount a strong public health response and to secure early access to vaccines. A large proportion of the spending, over 80%, went towards supporting workers, businesses and individuals so as to cushion them from the worst impact of the crisis. Crucially, we augmented the direct government measures with a series of COVID legislations that provided SMEs relief from their contractual obligations and protected them from financial distress and insolvency. Our fiscal response over the last two years, or for the two years 
20, fiscal year 2020 and 2021 included $36.9 billion drawn from our past reserves with the President's concurrence. And I thank the President for giving her assent to the use of the past reserves. These resources were crucial to our COVID fight. So all in all, this was money well spent to tackle the extreme downsides of COVID-19, to protect lives and to avoid mass unemployment. Our comprehensive and swift economic schemes enabled our resident employment and incomes to recover quickly to pre-COVID levels while keeping COVID-19 deaths low. Our policies and actions to respond to the pandemic have also distinguished us from other countries. We kept our air and sea ports open and ensured an uninterrupted flow of critical supplies. We enhanced our reputation as a trusted node that can be relied upon even when other parts of the world shut down. We also stand out in the world because of how our population rallied together in this crisis. Through all the trials and tribulations, we held together as a society and pulled through as one united people. We kept faith with our fellow Singaporeans, took care of the non-Singaporeans in our midst, and everyone did our part in the interest of the common good. And various surveys reflect these outcomes. According to a global survey done by Pew Research Centre, we are one of the few countries in the world where the sense of unity is higher today than before the pandemic. Another recent survey, this one done by the Edelman Trust Institute, found that trust in government remains high in Singapore. In fact, it's a record high. Singaporeans generally trusted the government's advice and cooperated with the measures. This is unlike many other countries where people railed against the public health measures and trust in government went down. Importantly, Singaporeans' trust in one another increased. We supported and looked out for one another throughout this crisis. As a result, many Singaporeans felt that their relationships with their neighbours, family and friends were maintained or have it become stronger. We have deepened the reservoir of trust and strengthened our social capital. Indeed, there have been many bright spots amidst the dark clouds, many stories of personal sacrifices and selfless dedication, instances where we came together as a community and as a nation to fight this crisis of a generation. On behalf of the government, I would like to put on record our appreciation to everyone who contributed to our COVID fight. Our Our workers and unions, as well as tripartite partners who marshaled resources, rolled out support and helped countless businesses and workers through difficult times. Our companies and trade associations, NGOs, as well as community groups who came together to contribute their time and know-how to fortify our response and support the vulnerable. Our public officers who went beyond the call of duty Many toiled selflessly behind the scenes to plan and roll out a multitude of programs and policies, working shoulder to shoulder with the people and private sectors. Our dauntless healthcare workers and many others who operated on the front lines of the crisis, whether it was at our borders or in the foreign worker dormitories, whether it was in our clinics and hospitals or in quarantine facilities. They willingly assumed personal risk over and over again, just so that the rest of us could be safe. They rose to the occasion when the going got tough, even in the darkest of times. We are therefore honoured to have a small contingent of our frontline warriors join us in Parliament today. They represent a cross-section of the wider community of individuals who fought bravely on the COVID front lines. Nurses and doctors and other healthcare professionals in the hospitals and in the community, educators and social service professionals and workers who served our students and vulnerable groups right through the crisis, 
transport workers, supermarket and warehouse managers, and other frontline workers who kept essential services going, including our ports and land links, staff in both the public and private sectors who ran critical backroom operations to maintain supply chains, care facilities, and many other services, safe distancing ambassadors, SAF officers and soldiers, and home team responders who mounted large-scale responses in support of various policies and programs. This is just a sampling of all our frontline fighters. So, sir, I'd like to invite the COVID fighters who are here today to please stand. We express a grateful nation's deepest appreciation for your contributions and courage. Your dedication helped Singapore to keep going through unprecedented and uncertain times. Your acts of duty, sacrifice and care for fellow Singaporeans uplifted our spirits, boosted our confidence and kept all of us safe. So once again, we would like to say a very big thank you to all of you. Today, we ask ourselves, what lessons can we draw from this crisis? How can we improve our strategies and be better prepared for the next pandemic or even the next wave if it should come? There are no straightforward answers to these questions because COVID-19 was a very complex and wicked problem on a grand scale. Our battle with the virus was a journey with many twists and turns and with repeated surprises and disruptions along the way. The situation was dynamic and fluid with new information and developments unfolding daily. We had to operate in the fog of war. We always saw through a glass darkly and it was often not clear what our next course of action should be. We had many intense debates amongst ourselves, political office holders as well as civil servants. And in the end, we had to take decisions based on our best judgment and manage the consequences as well as we could. Even today, as we look back, there will be different perspectives on what had transpired or how certain aspects of the pandemic could have been differently managed. Indeed, our response to COVID-19 was by no means perfect. There were areas that we could have done better. We have highlighted them in the white paper. We have been forthright and transparent about this so that we can learn from our experiences. The point is not to look back and critique the past with 2020 hindsight, but to unpack how and why certain decisions were made at those points, what assumptions were held then, which con considerations should have been weighed differently, and how we can do better the next time. In particular, some of our initial responses fell short because we knew so little about the virus at the start of the outbreak. We operated on the basis of the best scientific assessments then, as well as the protocols from our SARS experience. So while SARS helped us to avoid a cold start, it also in some ways contributed to us making some wrong initial assumptions. And this is an important point, that while we learn from this and past experiences, we must also have the flexibility of mind to adjust to new situations and not be trapped by fixed views of how a crisis might unfold. For example, the initial prevailing view was that one needed to show symptoms before the virus could spread, which was the case with SARS. In fact, this turned out to be wrong with COVID-19. 
The virus was also spread by individuals with no symptoms. This wrong assumption contributed to several shortcomings in our initial response. For instance, our infection protocols in the migrant worker dormitories were insufficient, and we faced a major outbreak which almost resulted in a disaster. It took a Herculean effort by the government, private firms and NGOs to bring the situation under control and to provide migrant workers with the care and support they needed. And we never wavered from our commitment to take care of our migrant workers. We acted as quickly as possible and activated every resource we had available to control the situation. We have also learned from this episode and taken steps to plug the shortcomings in our system, something that Mr. Tan Minister Tan Si Ling will share later in this debate. Likewise, we started out advising the public to only wear masks when unwell, and we changed this later to mandate the use of masks in public spaces when we realised that asymptomatic transmission was possible. On hindsight, we should have been less definitive in our position on mask wearing from the outset. We should have encouraged facial coverings of some sort, including homemade masks, while we ramped up the production of surgical masks. This would have given people psychological reassurance that they could do something to protect themselves and would also have helped to slow down transmission and spread of the virus, even though the improvised mask only provided partial protection. In some other areas, like the implementation of safe management measures, or SMMs, we did the right thing. We designed measures that took into account the risk that was inherent in different settings and activities. But we allowed the perfect to become the enemy of the good. Our rules were, at times, too finely calibrated, too complicated to follow, and too difficult to implement. Uh, the varying group sizes, which I'm sure everyone remembers, different rules for adults and children, different sets of rules for physical activity in different settings are some examples of this. Aggravating the problem, the rules had to be adjusted as circumstances changed, sometimes at short notice. So again, looking back, we should have tried much harder to simplify things and gone for more broad brush measures that would have reduced the implementation cost and burden. And fortunately, we did learn along the way and eventually simplified the rules to just three health protocols and five SMMs. One of the most difficult judgment calls we had to make was on managing our borders. Border restrictions are an important defence against the virus, but we also know that such measures only help to buy time. They cannot completely stop the virus from coming in. So the question is, how far do we go in tightening our borders, recognising that this will also impose a huge cost on livelihoods and on Singapore, Singapore's reliance on the world for a living? Reflecting on our experience, our sense is that at the beginning, we should have built in a margin of safety and tightened borders, border measures more aggressively the moment the virus showed signs of spreading across borders even when there might have been some risk of us overreacting to these sickness. This would have brought up, bought us time to understand the virus and build up our hospital capacity. Furthermore, having decided that we should allow Singaporeans living abroad to return home, we should have acted sooner to ramp up the provision of quarantine and isolation facilities for the returning residents. At the same time, Border measures can only do so much. So once the virus takes hold within the community, we could have eased our border restrictions more responsively, as the main danger would no longer be from cases coming from abroad. In particular, we took some time to resume the entry of long-term pass holders into Singapore, because we found that even with pre-departure testing, a high percentage of travellers from certain countries were still testing COVID positive on arrival. And our concern was that the large number of infected persons could easily overwhelm our isolation facilities and healthcare capacity. It was a judgment call we had to make at that time, and not without reason. But we also know that 
these restrictions created significant difficulties for some groups of long-term pass holders, such as employment pass holders with families here, but who were abroad or vice versa. Some of them endured prolonged family separation and disruption to their work, and Singapore did incur reputational cost and lost some goodwill from this segment of the community who also had their homes here. On reflection, we could have let the long-term pass holders back in sooner, or at least prioritised entry for some groups, such as those with families here. We subsequently learned from these experiences and adjusted our border responses when we dealt with the Omicron variant in late 2021. Members will remember we swiftly implemented a not-to-land policy to travellers from certain countries, and we applied a combination of hotel and home quarantine for other travellers, depending on where they came from. The quick tightening of rules created a lot of inconvenience for those returning from their vacations then, because this was in December 2021. But it was necessary. And once we learned more about Omicron and determined that it was less severe and not of significant concern, we eased the measures quickly as well. So that was one example of how we learned from the experiences with border restrictions. Another example came up in December last year when China moved away from its zero COVID policy. At that time, China experienced a significant surge in cases and several countries like the US, Japan and South Korea imposed tighter restrictions on arrivals from China. But we did not do so. And the reason is because we assessed that there were no new variants of concern detected in China and the viral strains there were already circulating around the world and in our community. Furthermore, our arrivals from China were relatively few and only a small proportion of them had COVID. We were therefore confident that the Chinese arrivals would not put too much pressure on our healthcare system and we decided at that time not to tighten restrictions. That judgment proved correct. So throughout the last three years, we had to continually make such tough calls in the midst of great uncertainty and ambiguity, often without an established playbook to guide us, nor the luxury to wait and see. We didn't get every call right. We regret the inconveniences and frustrations caused to Singaporeans and everyone in Singapore when this happened. At the same time, we are grateful for the fortitude and forbearance that everyone had shown when we had to put in tough measures and also when there were shortcomings and errors in our policies and implementations. This is the nature of dealing with a crisis. We will always be faced with incomplete information. We have to judge what is the best way forward based on what we know and respond quickly rather than wait for all the facts to come in, by which time it might be too late to act. Indeed, there will never be a perfect response in a crisis that is as complex, unpredictable and fast-moving as COVID-19. In such a crisis, no policy can cater for every eventuality. No plan can be implemented perfectly because there will always be time pressure and resource constraints. What's more important is to be honest in our appraisal of our own actions and to keep on learning and improving and striving to do better. That's the spirit behind this white paper. And that's how we have distilled the key lessons that Singapore should take away to be better prepared for the next pandemic. For this debate, let me focus on three broad lessons. First, fortifying our public health system to better respond to the next pandemic. On several occasions over the last three years, our healthcare system came under immense pressure. We had to activate the entire healthcare ecosystem to cope with surges. We called on the private and community hospitals to augment our capacity. Testing had to be ramped up nationally at, a, at an unprecedented scale and pace. We had to tap on both public and private sector laboratories to expand our testing capa capacities. 
Throughout MOH and NCID work closely with research laboratories and infectious disease experts outside of the government to understand the changing nature of the virus, perform epidemiological modelling and accelerate the development of diagnostics and therapeutics. Through these collective efforts, we protected our healthcare system from being overwhelmed and averted many deaths. But this was not without significant strain on the system and on our healthcare workers who shouldered the massive responsibility of treating and caring for infected persons. So to be better prepared for the next pandemic, we must strengthen the resilience of our healthcare system. We will need to build on our plans to strengthen the primary care system which we are now pursuing through Healthier SG. We will also strengthen the relationships we have established with the private sector through our COVID-19 response so that in a future pandemic, we can support more flexible responses and faster mobilization of resources. And while we have done well in our vaccination efforts, our vaccine resilience can be fortified further with local manufacturing capability. At the same time, we must grow our expertise in public health and pandemic management. In particular, we need to be able to detect the spread of novel pathogens quickly through effective surveillance and develop swift response measures to control the spread of the disease. We already have some of these capabilities, especially in the area of communicable disease control and management, which we had beefed up after SARS. These currently reside in various parts of our healthcare system, for example, in the NCID, the National Public Health Laboratory, and within MOH itself. To consolidate these capabilities and expertise, we will take the next step to set up a dedicated centre for public health, similar to what other countries have done in setting up centres for disease control. This will enable us to develop stronger competence in public health and grow these capabilities over time. And later in this debate, Minister Ong Yi Kang will elaborate on these plans. Second, enhancing forward planning capabilities. Our planning parameters for the pandemic were largely based on the SARS experience, but it quickly became clear that these parameters were not adequate. SARS was a short regional outbreak, largely confined to hospital settings. COVID-19 turned out to be more transmissible, though less severe than SARS, and the pandemic continued for several years, and not just a few months. And this greatly strained our healthcare capacity and manpower. Just as COVID-19 was different from SARS, the next novel pathogen will be different from COVID-19. With SARS, we had a pathogen that was highly severe, but with low risk of spread. With COVID-19, we have a pathogen that is only moderately severe, but with higher risk of spread. The more dangerous scenario will be one where we have a pathogen that has both high mortality and high contagion risk. So we will need to broaden the range of baseline scenarios for pandemic planning and review the resources we need to respond to these different scenarios. Being prepared and making investments early can yield immense dividends, especially during a crisis. But at the same time, realistically, we cannot plan for every possibility. Every new pathogen we meet will involve a degree of dealing with the unknown and it will be prohibitively expensive to cater for a wide range of worst cases. So we will have to strike the right balance to make good use of our limited resources. This may involve planning for contingencies that can be pivoted just in time to support our pandemic response, so we don't have to build layers of redundancies that may remain underused outside of a crisis, but cost us a disproportionate amount of resources to maintain. In other words, our response will have to be a combination of preparedness and improvisation. Some scrambling is inevitable and inherent in the process as we discover more information and consider the need to adjust our posture along the way. 
And that is why we must dedicate resources and equip our crisis management structures with better forward planning capabilities so that we anticipate, better anticipate and imagine what might happen next, be prepared for the unexpected and be ready to adapt to changing circumstances as they unfold. By doing so, we don't have to front load all of the investments to cater for all contingencies, but we must create a dynamic, forward-oriented organisation and process whose main mission is to anticipate and monitor risk to keep buying insurance where needed. So as the crisis develops, we can continue to buy more insurance and options for the future. Now, to be clear, we did set aside some capacity, capacity to do such forward planning during the last three years. But it was very hard to do this well because our officers were already fully stretched, fighting the immediate fire. So whatever forward planning capacity we had, we had competed with operational demands for resources and mindshare. And again, learning from this in future pandemics, we will set up a dedicated forward planning team with the bandwidth and expertise to look ahead. And this will help us better anticipate the next bound, develop our next course of action, and pivot more effectively as the situation evolves. Related to all this is the third lesson, how we can strengthen our resilience as a nation. Our COVID-19 experience has been a stark reminder of our vulnerability. As a small and open economy, we were more badly hit than others by a global disruption that was outside of our control. We found ourselves in situations where it was uncertain whether we could secure critical supplies even when we were willing to pay a premium for them. In the early months of the pandemic, we witnessed how other countries had started hoarding essential medical and food supplies, and we grew increasingly concerned about whether we could replenish our own stock. Significant work had to be undertaken to activate emergency procurement measures and to tap on long-standing networks to secure what we needed. We also had to design new processes to keep our port and land links open, but in a safe way. So the pandemic has underscored the importance of building up additional redundancies and buffers that we can fall back upon during a crisis. And Minister Gan Kim Yong will elaborate on these efforts, including our stockpiling strategies, diversification of supply chains for essential items, and expansion of local production where this makes sense. Besides having additional buffers, resilience is also about being more adaptable. We must be able to marshal our existing assets and resources quickly and be nimble enough to move fast when the unexpected happens. For example, when we first managed to bring protein and meat supplies into Singapore, which we had to do, there was an issue of where to store these goods. MTI scrambled. This was under Minister Chan then, when he was at MTI. We, and we eventually solved this by sourcing and bringing in refrigerated conta containers, what they call reefers, to provide sufficient cold storage capacity. And we ramped up the capacity of the power supply to support their operations. Where possible, the government will design facilities to be multi-use so that they can be repurposed or redeployed during a crisis. In particular, we will apply further thought into how we can enhance the resilience of our public infrastructure, especially for new major projects like Tuas Megaport and the Changi Airport Terminal 5. We also need to be able to convert and repurpose existing spaces at short notice into facilities that can be used to meet emergency needs in a crisis. Uh, we had faced a steep learning curve trying to do this at the start. Singapore Expo had to be converted into community isolation and care facilities, hotels into quarantine facilities, community centres into vaccination centres, vacant schools and SAF camps into temporary housing for migrant workers. Each of these process took a lot of work and learning from this experience, we will continue to build up our capabilities 
so that we can pivot and respond more effectively in future. Our private sector partners are a key source of support in these efforts. Working alongside them over the course of the pandemic has showed us all that there is much more that we can do by coming together, by sharing our resources, capabilities and networks. So we will do more to sustain and strengthen our partnerships with the private sector. For example, through cooperation agreements, to show up our pandemic preparedness plans and to mobilise our national resources more comprehensively in times of need. One crucial resource that enabled us to respond effectively and bounce back quickly in this pandemic was our financial reserves. Indeed, our reserves is an integral part of our national resilience. It shielded our economy and our people from the harshest impact of the pandemic, and it remains our best safeguard in any crisis. It is therefore our duty to ensure that the reserves are used prudently and judiciously so that future generations can continue to benefit from it. Ultimately, what lies at the heart of our resilience is our people. Because that's our most important defence in a pandemic, to be psychologically prepared, to stay united, and to support one another and keep faith with each other. Throughout this pandemic, Singaporeans were socially responsible and responded to the calls for self-discipline with admirable fortitude and patience. We saw a strong communitarian spirit and a high level of volunteerism. Many ground projects were initiated to rally the community in support of those who needed help. COVID-19 brought out the best in all of us, individually and collectively. Despite the pressures and fears, we did not give in, we did not succumb. We stood firmly together and left no one behind. That is a mark of our growing maturity and resilience as a people and as a nation. Mr. Speaker, in this debate, I invite everyone to reflect on how far we have come over the last three years. It has been an emotional journey of ups and downs for all of us, in the same way that our response has had its fair share of setbacks and successes. In the end, it was the whole nation coming together that made the difference in our fight against COVID-19, allowing us to surmount the odds and face the challenges without fear. So the aim of this white paper and this debate is not to rate the government's or Singapore's performance in this pandemic. We have done our best and that's what matters. In the final analysis, the long arc of history will judge how well we have responded to this crisis of a generation and how well we have learned and remembered the lessons of COVID-19. Today, we are here to give thanks, for we have found our way through the pandemic and emerged from it intact and strengthened. We are here to pay tribute to all who have made countless sacrifices and worked so hard to get us through this crisis. We are here to learn, improve and be better prepared when the next pandemic comes. I hope we will not have to go through an episode like COVID-19 again. Unfortunately, we would have to be very lucky for my hope to be fulfilled. The next pandemic can happen sooner rather than later and quite possibly will be worse than COVID-19. But if it does happen, we can draw confidence and strength from what we have been through these past three years. Let us always remember the most important lesson of COVID-19, that we are stronger when we stand and work together. So let us resolve to stay united so that whatever the challenges ahead, we can overcome them as one people and one Singapore. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move.